our first webinar of 2021. Yay! 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 Ready. So ready. That's a nice picture behind you, Jeff. Oh, thanks. Cool to get going. I didn't know how to move it to get the wings in. All right, okay. It's, it, the wings are in the frame. Okay. Yeah, we've got the eye. Yeah. Hey, Tomcat. How you doing, buddy? All right. I need some attendees coming in. So we'll start up in just a minute, let everyone file in. Um, I had a major milestone today, gentlemen. I uh, broke 151 coascoped bird species for the year today. Wow. Half what I did last year for the whole year. I'm going for it. I'm going to have a bigger number this year. What, year, year list whole or Florida year list or, or what? Just how many different species I've managed to capture images of through the, the spotting scope so far. All right, so it's not a county or anything, it's just how many? Yeah, it's all Florida. It's a three county area, basically. Dare I ask quickly what the record is for the year list for birds in Florida, dare I ask? Oof. I don't remember. Right. Okay. Sadly. I'd have to look it up. It's... Uh, Probably shy of 400 species somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I imagine you've got a fair few. Yes, yeah, so high 300s, probably. Mm. Right. How many we got in now? We can see it at the bottom, can't we? 55. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, people are. It looks like it's slowed down. Um, mm, our a little bit. Down, coming in. So, um, Rob Wilton is uh, behind the scenes, just sending a, a message out to everybody. Um, hey Rob, there he is. Hi there. Hi. He's yep. he's with us and uh, taking care of it. Um, so what we're going to do today is, um, you know, we're going to kick off the year. As you know, 2020 was a challenging year for everybody. Uh, it's a year unlike any that I think any of us have seen. Um, certainly, and hopefully, it'll be a long time before we ever <laughs> experience anything like it again. Um, but you know, we're still a little bit under the, under the guise of this things are, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but you know, uh, it does look like we've got more of the same, obviously from, uh, kicking off 2021. So we're going to look back and what we're going to do today is, uh, Simon Brunby over there, Paul Hackett and myself, we're going to just kind of review a handful of our favorite, um, digiscoped images from 2020. Um, and maybe not our best images we took. Uh, in some cases, I know I um, selected some that had a better story or a story that was meaningful to me in some way um, when I selected the stories rather than perhaps the prettiest picture. Um, sadly, Robert Wilson was gonna join us and, and couldn't, but we've got some of his pictures as well that I'll share. Um, I guess we're all started. What we'll do, we have a Q&A button that you should see on the bottom for folks that are uh, with us. Um, and we've got the chat function. But if you, as you have questions, if you can drop them into the Q&A as a little uh, more user friendly. Um, we've got uh, um, two people, Paul Cardos in the US and Rob Wilton that will tackle some of those questions as we go along. But um, we will uh, get to all your questions. We'll have some Q&A at the end. So without a whole lot more ado, what I would like to do is get this thing started and we'll share this PowerPoint. Share that and start it off. And breathe. Boom. <laughs> it worked. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here we are. We're calling this the best of 2020, and perhaps more um, appropriate to call this the um, rather than the best of 2020, we call it the favorites of 2020, perhaps. And uh, what I'll do is I'll kick it off. Um, you know, I'm the newest member of the team here as of last January. And um, I've been mostly shooting the 883 um, and just absolutely with smartphone. Oh, you can't see it. There we go, put it in front of my face. The smartphone and the adapter um, with the iPhone, all of my images. 
Um, Simon and Paul have a different take. We all have different styles. Um, but at the end of the day, we all have a lot of fun and we all get great pictures. Um, you know, that's, that's the real gist of what we're, what we're talking about. So what we'll do is I'll kick it off guys and start with my first selection and, you know, not as tack sharp as I would have liked, but a special, um, bird. And it, I also kind of wanted to tell the story of the year. Um, this was one of our very first shows uh, of the season in February. Um, Robert Wilson and I got to work together um, at the Festival of the Cranes in Port Aransas, Texas. And the star of the show, the Whooping Cranes, um, made a nice guest appearance very close to the, uh, uh, to the venue where we we're working and selling optics. And um, we were hoping they'd stay there. People kept coming in and said, it's amazing. They're, you know, right down here by the boardwalk, just a half mile away. We finally finished up, you know, cleaned up all our gear and raced out there and they were still there. And it was, uh, you know, um, kind of a bittersweet moment. This is one of the last, the first and last festivals of the year. Uh, Robert and I thought we were going to look forward to a whole year of traveling together, um, bouncing all over the, uh, the U.S. Uh, hitting all these birding festivals, um, but as we know, COVID came. So that's why this is a, a favorite image of mine because it was just a special moment uh, with a coworker, and it was sort of the beginning of the end. After this, everything uh, changed dramatically, as you all know. So let's go to the next one, and uh, Mr. Hackett, you're up. What can you tell us about this story? Okay, this is in the UK. And this is an RSPB reserve for those uninitiated around the world listening. Um, you've made my day. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Really enjoyed that, that you've, uh, there's quite a few of you now actually. Um, this is a kitty wake and obviously um, the cliffs at Bempton on the east coast of the UK are a host to quite a big seabird colony. And with digiscoping, what I find is, is that I would love to encourage more digiscopers to take, try and get action shots. Everybody is great and you've got to learn and start taking a bird on a stick or bird on the ground, a bird on a tree. But if you study your subject, you will see observation and there's nothing more bountiful with choices of pictures than a seabird colony because it's all happening. All that it's better than, for the UK people, it's better than EastEnders, Coronation Street, all rolled into Emmerdale. It's, it's better than any of those rolled into one. The live action, and you can literally pick and choose. And I'd been watching this pair that I'd just been watching on, and they kind of, you, the, the male come back in, and there's a bit of a squabble goes on. And then there was another intruder, and I just literally did a burst with this, and I just got this shot. Now, clearly, I've cut the, I've cut the wing off on the right, but... For me, it's not about the shot being perfect. It's trying to create that emotion. And I think certainly with that picture, get out of here. That shot says, keep away from me, get out of here. Anyway, this is, oh, don't worry, that was quick. Um, so yeah, for me, that was shot with the, um, the 884 and my G9 Lumix with a, 20 mil pancake lens and the D810 adapter. Okay, Jeff, that's me. That was my first one. So Perfect. yeah, action shots. If anybody's digiscoping there tonight, let's see some more action shots and we'll try and give you some tips between us all at the end of the session in the Q and A, if people are brave enough to try and speak to us, we'll certainly try and help you out. Cause that's what we're here for. If you want to know stuff later on, please ask, cause it's a golden opportunity to do so. Indeed. And, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um, one of the unexpected side effects of COVID-19 and quarantining uh, as a whole was the fact that people really got re-engaged in nature, which was, you know, really uh, a wonderful thing to see. All of us are very passionate about the subject, obviously. Um, uh, so I couldn't be more excited to have a silver lining to such a gray cloud like that. But one of the unexpected uh, side effects of that is there are more um, new COA scope owners out there 
um, than ever. And uh, so we look forward to, you know, meeting a lot of you as well and helping you all uh, as you begin your journey with digiscoping. So that's, that's what we're doing today is just a start, but we'll have more uh, informative stuff moving forward. And Simon Brunby, tell us about this stunning shot. I've always loved this one. It is a great shot. Um, yeah, so they, uh, as we said uh, before we started uh, the broadcast, uh, we had to narrow down the amount of shots that we had to talk about uh, for the year uh, to uh, just a handful. And uh, as pretty much as, as Jeff had said, I didn't necessarily want to show all the most pretty shots or whatever that, I, that I've got for the year. Although, you know, I'm quite happy with this one, to be fair. Um, uh, some of the other shots are very much just about things that happened over the year. Um, yeah, it was a real year of uh, consideration and uh, uh, to look back and compound on the things that um, you'd done and learned. Uh, for me, I'd, um, it was a change of work on quite a, a dramatic scale. Uh, and I spent uh, the entire lockdown period um, doing um, breeding bird uh, infant yeah, for an ecology uh, company, uh, counting breeding birds on a uh, tessel in the Netherlands. So very lo lucky, I was very fortunate and in that there was not necessarily, there was places uh, which were more or less empty uh, which would normally be just snoon with uh, tourists and bird watchers and, what, and whatever. But, you know, they, these were the areas that I was counting on, um, counting birds on. And uh, one of the locations was uh, lots of um, uh, tulip fields, but various bulbs. Um, and uh, they're the preferential sites for things like yellow wagtails to, to breed in and along the, along the uh, grass berms uh, where you see lots of meadow pipits and things like that. And this is um, a, a pitch you'll see uh, quite often replicated, you know, with the, these wagtails singing their heads off, doing their little uh, song in what is apparently camouflaged habitat for them in amongst, you know, bright yellow and orange and red tulips. Uh, you, you can sometimes miss them, but it's, um, yeah, it's a, 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 the story goes a little bit deeper in that uh, these birds are living and breeding on these bulbs uh, and feeding in the direct area from them. But in order for these bulbs to be produced, there's an awful lot of chemicals going on them and uh, their numbers are dramatically declining. You can't, you struggle to think of a, another bird um, uh, that's more may, maybe yeah skylarks and things like that but definitely when you think about the dutch countryside in the um in the early spring and summer it's it's all these it's all about these bulb fields and uh, you know um yeah to think that you might not be able to see this at some point in the not too distant future and yeah it gave me kind of an insight into what was going on and i i got time to just sit there and think and photograph them and um, you know try and take it on and, and reaffirm my choices about uh, what I was doing for work and how I was living at home and you know the things I was using and the things I took for granted so I'm, I'm hoping that it's a similar story although maybe not exactly the same story but for a lot of people in that uh, people have had a year to take stock of what's important to them and um, you know where they want to go um, uh, after everything returns to um, you know, some kind of normality. So, yeah, that's basically where I was with this uh, little thing. Right. Yeah. Um, normally we hold the questions to the end, but this one's sort of pertinent, um, you know, on something you just had hit on, Simon. Uh, Yvonne asked uh, if the uh, harvest of the tulips does it allow for the birds, the, uh, the wagtails to play, <clears throat> just the timing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, breeding time for them is uh, is is um, they're usually bred and fledged because uh, the the birds are uh, they hatch out and as soon as they hatch out they're gone you know they're they're able to fly uh, or or run around so they're they're very very mobile and active in that sense um, what does happen is before the bulbs are harvested there's um, 
a machine which comes along to cut the flower heads off because obviously the the farmers don't want the flowers to go to seed so there's like um kind of like a lawn a lawn mower with a with a serrated cutter which right drives along over the top of the leaves because they want the leaves because the leaves give the the bulbs energy to give them nice big fat bulbs and then this mower machine goes over but there's no it doesn't look like there's any kind of correlation with um with with that and uh loss of uh loss of the birds the the main problem is the the neonicotinoids that are quite often used because obviously these plants uh are even though they're not necessarily a, a nectar plant tulips are not particularly a nectar plant they do produce pollen and you know bees and uh beetles and flying insects will come and pick up pick up pollen and stuff and neonicotinoids neonicotinoids being how they are it's quite often uh you know uh, you hear the stories about uh, the bee, great bee die off and pollinator die off and stuff like that. Well, these guys are eating those insects uh, uh, to greater or lesser extent. And, you know, there's, there is research done into it and I'm far from an expert on it, but it's, uh, it's definitely a trend that uh, appears to be relevant. So mm. yeah, these uh, beautiful little fellas are under all kinds of, uh, all kinds of pressure. So, so, you know, treat them as the little jewels that they are and, uh, and you know, Go out and see them and uh, appreciate them for what they are. Nice. No, that's a lovely shot, and it you know it also um, you know just sort of technically shows one of the aspects of great magnification. With great magnification, not only do you lose you know your field of view from side to side, but your depth of focus um, front to back becomes pretty narrow, and that's something we all struggle with, or you know it's a challenge that we face in digiscoping. But it works beautifully in this in this case. You know, I love it. So to set that to set that up with the scope, I've got the tripod. Uh, so on a te on a photography uh, side of things, these uh, these songbirds, as with many other songbirds, they all have a, fa a favoured perch. So they'll go to a spot, and that particular tulip that he was coming back to was was lying flat instead of facing up. It was just lying flat, and he he would come back to that, and you'd walk walk past within sort of ten meters of him, and he quite often just sit there and stay there hmm. and uh, yeah so all I did was uh, try to figure out what time of day would be good uh, on my free day so that I'd have sun on the bird you can see that this shadow is just uh, on, underneath the bird and on the back legs so this is maybe 10 o'clock or something like that so technically the uh, it's too late for good photography because the sun is quite strong and especially once you start magnifying it but I knew it would hit it had been a cool evening the, the day before and the, the day before that so the ground was fairly cool so then it was a case of setting the scope up uh, but a comfortable height for me but just above uh, the tulips so then I've got a little bit of tulips in the foreground so that blurs out and then uh, 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 getting the um, uh, I'm half Dutch in my head and half English in my head, uh, focusing on, on the bird where the bird was going to be. And then because you've just got that very slight angle, you've got a little bit of, of roll off uh, towards the background for the, uh, for the tulips that are in the background. Just fill the frame. You don't need to see any blue sky or anything like that. Just fill the frame with, with the subject that you're, um, you know, you're trying to position. And then this is just using the rule of thirds, very, very basically just with the rule of thirds, just positioning in within that square. Nice. All right, are we ready? Yeah, J Move Jeff, forward. could I just quickly, um, yeah. I've had a couple of messages from a couple of friends who've joined tonight. Yeah. Um, they don't know what digiscoping is. So they've joined on a kind of photography kind of a, a thing. So can I just take a minute or two quickly? Just mm -hmm. to explain it, or do you want to do it? I'll do it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, so for people not versed with what digiscoping is, in simple terms, it's taking a scope, one I made earlier. Let's try and get it off a stand here. There we go. There we go. That's my scope. Can't really yep, see we're, it. We're right in front of you to see it, unfortunately. Yeah, with the, yeah I know it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I know. And on the end of it, I've attached a camera. So anything that's digital can be attached to a scope. And what I'll do is I'll just try and help by taking out the zoom. Bear with me, gentlemen, ladies, and everybody else. There you go. So, there's my camera. Let's get this back in the thing. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the eyepiece that goes into the thing. I've got a zoom, so I've got the opportunity to magnify it. So essentially, digiscoping is taking pictures with something digital, either a camera, phone, or whatever. In the old days, I used to use um, Sony high 8mm camcorder. 
years ago and take a frame off it. That was mm -hmm. maybe 21 years ago. Um, and the idea is that we take pictures using the eyepiece connected to the scope and the scope with the eyepiece gives us fantastic magnification. So anybody who is a photographer that's never heard of this, um, quickly, we start, because we use micro four thirds cameras, not full frame cameras, we start about 1200 millimeters on 25 mag and up to over 3000 millimeter at 60 mm -hmm. times mag. So it's about the magnification for us. And as Simon says, we're not encroaching on the bird too much, but that's basically the essence, the jizz of what digiscoping is. If anybody wants to bang any questions, please put them on the Q&A and we'll do yep. our best. Sorry, Jeff, to hijack that, but I just yeah, no worries. A um, of people keep sending it going though, so we get so we get to our 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 last ones, or we'll have to jump ahead if we get too yeah, yeah, long winded. Yeah. It's we're down one speaker though, so maybe be. Let's see. All right, this is uh, one from Robert Wilson. Uh, I don't know the backstory behind it, but this is uh, a female on Hinga feeding her chicks. Um, we're both in Florida, so you know I know uh, we we have a lot of the same subjects. He's on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast of Florida here, and this is uh, in a cabbage palm, um, and got three chicks that faces that only a mother could love. Uh, the female on Hingas have that brown bib. The males would be all black with some little white kind of fringes coming off the side and back of their head um, that you can see. But that's that's the story on this one. Don't know the, what camera scope he was using but that's a, a lovely shot it was one of his favorites very nice shot i love it gh4883 that's what he used <laughs> guaranteed <laughs> guaranteed i know yeah um Rob. let's see here so round two gentlemen let's see who's up first simon tell us about this this image yeah um so it's a it's a blue tit and um yeah lockdown what what more what can we talk about lockdown uh again appreciate the things around you so uh i live in um uh, the netherlands is uh or shall i say uh, uh, england just england is about three times larger than the netherlands uh, i live in the netherlands and the netherlands has half of the population of England, just England, not Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And uh, most of that population is uh, along the, um, what they call the Randstad, it's along the edge. Uh, so it's uh, Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And um, where, where I live here in Alkmaar, it's also uh, very populated. And um, my garden is six meters long by two meters wide. And uh, we have a, a street, which is communal street. And in that street, there is a pear tree so that the people that live around us can uh, pick fresh fruit and bake pears and things like that. And in that tree, I have about five bird feeders. And over the years, I've just been um, bringing birds, more, more and more birds into the garden. And it's a um, point of contact for uh, my neighbors to get to know my neighbors so we can go outside and then oh did you see the birds blah, blah, blah. oh it's really nice in the summer you know when you, you i've had uh flocks of about 200 siskins bear in mind my garden's six meters six meters by two meters and then it's uh, a, a tree in our bed uh and the rest is sort of uh you know cobbles and things and then people other people's houses and yeah, i've had flocks of uh 200 siskins um have been um there are lots of blue tits, lots of great tits. By the way, it's the Great British Bird Count this weekend, so get involved in that. And if you live in the Netherlands, it's uh, yeah the the same, but it's the Town Vogel uh, Teldag. There's uh, you can also count your birds for half an hour in the garden and, and register that all on Vogelbescherming Nederland, which is the um, yeah American British Bird Association or uh, uh, RSPB equivalent. Uh, so that's really cool to do and then we can all count the birds that we've seen so this is one of my birds it that's a blue tit that thinks it's some kind of fruit eaten parrot uh, that's gonna and they just come and just pick at these massively oversized pears completely ruin the pears but the birds absolutely love it so you know they get their fruit we talk about it with the friends and stuff so yeah covid this is another lockdown thing for me it's uh yeah birds in your own garden appreciate them get to know the people around you it is a community that we live in in more ways than one 
Um, and yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'll talk more about that the garden later with uh, my next uh, still because that's where we're going with that. So, okay. uh, let me quickly do something, Simon. I remembered when I started the screen share, I forgot to uh, highlight for video, and I'm going to stop and reshare the screen because we're going to need that. Uh, optimize for a video clip. Yes. Okay. Now. Sorry about this, minor. Take two. Oh. All right. Go away, little dachshund. <laughs> I didn't know she was sleeping under my chair. Um, all right. So it's live, Jeff. It's live as we know it, yeah. Jim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh dear, well, give me a beer. I need a beer. Settle in my chair. In my armchair. Okay. So this is uh, another shot from Robert Wilson, one of his images, and and here we have a tricolored heron, uh, so named because of the purple, blue, and white uh, coloration they have. But this bird in particular, um, they're a really schnazzy uh, waiter, one of my favorites over here. They're a lot more elegant, longer and leaner, more attenuated with a very, very, very long bill. Um, and this particular one is in high breeding uh, uh, condition uh, for a period of just, just basically a few weeks um, when they're courting. Uh, the adults will get this electric skin color around the bill, you know, and the uh, the tricolors have this almost fluorescent blue um, skin coloration that they have. Uh, their plumes lengthen, um, you know, so very showy, uh, beautiful birds. And this one's uh, doing a, a, a mating display, actually. Um, not sure where, possibly at a rookery, but that's all I know about that one. Paul Hackett, on the other hand, can tell us a lot about this image, I'm sure. Okay. Anybody who knows me knows I love a kingfisher. And based in the county of Hertfordshire in the UK here, we are seriously blessed with some very showy, posy kingfishers. Um, up until lockdown, I had about three sites I could go to. Um, one of my friends, he introduced me to this site. Um, it's quite close to another site. And we, over the winter months, we get these kingfishers that come in and they can be, sometimes can be juvenile birds, you know, from the, from the, from the spring, uh, but also uh, local adults. Um, and on this particular bird, this, what I, this is what I call bulletproof. And we can see that it's a male um, with the um, top mandible being black and the bottom mandible being black as well. And there's no white tip at the end, so therefore not really juvenile. And if you really look carefully, you'll notice that the top mandible is slightly shorter. It's a little bit white, but you can see it's physically shorter. And sometimes I can identify similar birds just with a gape in an actual gape in the mandible. Anyway, this bird particular picture um, has got two points to make for me. Um, Everybody goes on about that we should, some people I, I take where I get the kind of stereotypical answer is, oh yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't come off the 25 times mag, I don't, I don't, because I don't, I don't, I've got my sharpest. I think that then leads me to say, well, have you tried it? Because uh, most of the time, um, if I'm in a hide or I'm out birding and people see what I'm doing, they will approach me. Oh, uh, you're using it on 60. Why are you using it on 60? Well, this image that you see in front of you was a in a format of um, 3b2 and I tried to chopped it into something a little bit different so I went custom and just literally just chopped the head there wasn't much more above and there wasn't much more below but it was shot on 60 times so anybody listening with, who has a scope and realizes is that possible well clearly it is clearly I needed the light uh, to get some kind of um, shutter speed going, but for That's me, I've, 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 yeah, I've just been so lucky, Jeff. I mean, I've got, I've got. Um, it was, there was one picture that my friend sent me of his son in the middle of a town centre in Hertfordshire, and it was about three winters ago. And his son is bent down on the pavement on the side of a lake, and on the edge of the pavement, 
is a kingfisher. It's a juvenile kingfisher. And his phone is there. I kid you not. And the bird is there. It literally was eight inches. He was just mm. hand, handheld. And I've got this picture uh, of it. It's just, we're just, as I say, I keep going on about it, but we're so lucky. And as I said, we still got three of them. But back to this picture. Why kingfishers? I think if you've anybody seen a kingfisher up close, rather than just the electric blue blur we get, uh, people don't realize that the colors or the feathers uh, in a kingfisher, there's no pigmentation. They're actually iridescent. That means they change with the light. So therefore, on some days, the bird looks green on the back, and then some days it looks blue. So that's purely the light. You've also got that with hummingbirds as well and a few other species I'm sure Jeff could point out because Jeff is a very good birder over there in the States, as I have attested when we have been out a few times and he always updates my life a list when we've, uh, it always takes me out into another new place and see some new birds. Um, so basically two things back to what I'm saying to summarize, do go to 60. Sometimes it might not be any good. Sometimes it will, but the distance I'm at with this bird is probably less than 10 yards. It's like bulletproof know where they are on the river they just sit um and also don't be constricted to fall formal kind of shapes of what posting i like that image of slim it's not even 69 it's even slimmer whatever it may be but it was just an idea to show people that don't be conventional so as i said with my first first picture let's go for the action my second picture is try something different it's not like film you can just delete it I mean, I know that if I have a good session, I've got maybe, if I've been out all day, I've got maybe 1,500 pictures to go through and I will go through every one and discard it. So the quick lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, who's listening, if you take many pictures and you do your reviewing, quick tip here, take your first picture, go to the second one. Is it sharp or blurred in the other? Delete the first, number one is now your marker. Go through that batch. If you shot maybe 50 or 60 on that session, take two or three. So you keep the best of the best. So that's my first tip out the hat there, Jeff, just to help people waffling a little bit, but literally just getting, just obviously that's what I was trying to say about the picture. Yep. I mean, who doesn't love a kingfisher? And, and I love the little, you know, the tiny little feathers around the orbital ring around the eye. You know, I mean, what are they? Two millimeters long? If that, yeah. yeah, you know, it's just phenomenal, just the detail. Um, and that's one of the things, whoops, yeah. one of the things that, uh, um, you know, I love so much about the, the Koa Promenar series scopes, you know, with the fluoride lens. You just really, they just really pop. You get every detail. That's on 60 times. That's on the full magnification. And people go, so? So, yet again, I bring it back because obviously I've been with Coward over. How many years now have we been now? 10 years? Don't, don't count them up. I yeah, find it better not to count those kind of I'm things. getting on a bit now. 61, <laughs> I'm 61 in two or three weeks, mate. I'm getting on a bit. Young man that I am. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, but the, the, the scope for me, it's bright. And yeah. the one thing, and um, the one thing I will say before we move on from this picture, it keeps producing. It keeps producing. When other people are trying to get large Im images, using 50 55 some of the scopes i've seen the other scopes um and pictures of people taking large images it's just the resolution is not there i think that's the thing about our scope is is that the definition and the resolution in the scope itself which is then magnified onto the sensor of the camera right mm -hmm. next one move on my mind. all right we're up right. over a half hour guys so we're gonna have to try and speed up. a little bit more uh, this was one of my favorites uh of last year um it would be, you know, probably my favorite favorite if I were in the UK where these things are a lot more revered. But I mean, I see ospreys every time I open the door here in Florida. Uh, we're lucky that way, but they're still beautiful birds. But just um, this bird was flying straight at me, you know, so I was constantly having to recheck the focus. And I'm just kind of plugging along like this two handed refocusing and hitting the, the shutter button, hoping something came out. Um, and this was within the first month of getting the, the Koa scope. Um, so that's the story there. I froze um, an osprey in flight, you know, coming at me rather than staying in the same focal plane uh, parallel to me, which is a little easier. And it just made me giddy to have this kind of an image. Um, all right. 
Moving on, round three. And Mr. Hackett starts off. Okay. Last year, I went to that place we call Benton Cliffs, and I've never seen a weasel in my life. This is the first weasel I've ever seen. Plenty of stoats. So the stoat in one of the mammals in the UK is probably the one we see the most anyway, from far as I know. And there was a family of weasels just below one of the viewpoints. And nobody was watching these, but the challenge is they're like lightning. They seriously move and they're literally going through all these little holes. You'll see the hole in front of you in the embankment. And it was just a way, I, I likened it really. You know, when you go to the fun fair and you've got that hammer, and if something pops up and you smack it on the head, it was one you couldn't catch up with. It. That was me trying to do that with the scope. You just couldn't catch it. It was so quick. And this paused for about two seconds maximum. And I kind of waited and waited. And I just, I just, it was, this was more of a fluke. I mean, to see these things. And if you notice, I think this was the female because she had a little bit of a white. And the other, the other spot, it was the, the adult, I think it was three kits and the adult, and the adult male and female. And it was just brilliant to watch for me. So for me to get this image was just like fluke more than yeah. skill. Obviously I had to try and get the focus in the best I could. And I, I basically focused on the head. That's what I tried to focus for. Uh, but unbelievably fast. I mean, people say to me, you do flight shots. This was more difficult than flight shots. It seriously, seriously was. And uh, I think I stuck it out for about 40 minutes. And I think I only shot. 20 pictures i didn't bother for some of them because yeah. <laughs> gone you knew you'd time, got it. there, it's gone gone i'm completely gone there you go jeff that was and that was the reason i put it in because it's a mammal because well mostly with these zoo webinars we've done before we've kind of focused on birds i just thought let's just try something different because there was loads of birds i wanted to put in i was itching to put born birds in but i thought a mammal as well yeah. nice oh, 883 and the g9 just, just jump, jump in, guys. We, we've got a, 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 a grey box appearing on the um, over, over the images. A few, few people are picking it up. I'm getting it on mine as well. Interesting. Grey box. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. There's a grey box. There's a grey box, Jeff. Really true. Okay. Hold on a second. Let's restart because I don't know what's going on. I'm not seeing it on my end. Stopping the share. Hold on, folks. Bear with us, it's the, the great fun of live. <laughs> Technical problems. Close it. Okay, we'll take this again. Share screen. On that again, optimize, share screen. Have we got to launch the meeting again? Start. No, I don't think so. Okay, I've just got four icons on the right hand side of us four panelists with Robert Wilson's mugshot. Yeah, you've got a grey, uh, you've got that grey box again, just along the grey top edge at the moment. Interesting. Hmm. Strange but true. Stupid. Right, I can't seem to get the. Oh, I'm back in the room, back in the room. Okay, take two. Take two. Okay. Fun and games. Three. This is live, folks. You don't get this on the TV, do you? What you pay your BBC license for? Are we still paying that? <laughs> Come on, Hopefully. Netflix, Amazon. Yeah. Do your bit. Hold on, I got to reopen the, the program. The program. Do so we need to... Uh, oh, oh come back in um like a month or something like that with a bird list of what we've managed to shoot like, during the lockdown and try and get try and beat jeff's yeah. 50 50 well, how many was it 150 yeah, we had a chat everybody before you came online and Jeff 151. Shot 151 birds in his state of right around his home in florida in just out 20 28 days yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to be able to do 151 species in Yeah, you guys have to wait a little while. That's, that's yeah, but minute. mate, when you come over here for our it bird fairs, you have to fight for your birds. We go over there and you've got them on the end of your, end of your nose. Well, yeah. Easy, isn't it, Simon, when we go over there? <laughs> it's easy peasy, man. Hey? <laughs> eh? 
Come uh, and meet the real birders, Jeff. You have done. You've come over. You showed us how to do it anyway. God bless you. Yeah. Jeff is the only one I know when it comes to bird fair in the UK and actually gets up early and goes birding. One of the few in the optics marquee. Very few. You're on your own, mate. You're a special breed. <laughs> All right, seen yes. as well. Pardon me. You guys can give a, some digiscoping tips while I try and pull this back up. Excuse the, pardon the delay. Okay, is there any questions we can answer, Rob? Anybody I've, I've, got any questions? I've been, I've been covering all the questions. We've had lots of questions, though. The, the, it really is good. Everyone's um, firing the questions over. So I'm, I'm typing away at uh, full speed here. <laughs> so, uh, Keep keep them coming. It's it's, it's great. All right. Um, so have we got anybody that's got any questions? Right. Let's go, let's go through it. Well, we can re we can recap. Uh, there's on a guy some called things, Jason De Beer. Jason De Beer. I've noticed that guy. Jason, you're still there. Can you give us a wave? Put, can you clink on the bottom icon? Raise hand if you're there. Just to let us know you're there. So we're trying to answer your question for you. Maybe, maybe not. No. Okay. So people, what's the most popular camera to use? I think that comes up a lot. So um, what we'll do is I'll try and explain why I use what I use. So my background, as I said, was the camcorders, blah, blah, blah. Took them through to the compacts. We are talking 20, 22 years this year of digiscoping and doing it and teaching in this country. Um, a long, a long ago is what five or six years. We got these mirrorless cameras came in, these micro four thirds cameras. They're lighter, yeah. and the the community has kind of, and it's not a huge community, but we've kind of gone over to some of these micro four thirds cameras. And Panasonic seemed to come up well, um, Sony and the Olympus Olympus micro four thirds. Um, and we also, so we've got a choices really of how we connect them. So it's the eyepiece, as we talked about before. So we can either get an, a, an adapter that goes over it and have a, um, just a camera body and connect it to that adapter. Uh, the adapter's got a piece of glass on it to stop dirt getting in and getting the sensor. That's one method. You'll find these all on the car website, which uh, Rob will give us in the end. Or you can use what we have this, our kind of way of using it. I'm just bringing this camera back in again to show you. So I've got to do that. And there, oh, I'm going right, that's it, burning the bolt. There's a pan, there's a 20 mil pancake lens just here. So that's my body, pancake lens, the adapter and the eyepiece. Um, we use sometimes, a lot of us use a 20, mil, 20 millimeter pancake lens. There are, other, there are other ones that we can use. I think there's a, Simon and Sigma, 30 mil. So in other words, yeah. let's just get this into proportion. Camera, DSLR, we can use any type now. Full frame, one um, Canons, which are 1.6 crop, or a micro four thirds. So that's basically what you're looking right now. If, or Canon, Nikon, full frames. Um, and now Canon and Nikon have come into the things. And don't forget, we have the use of the phone. And... There's Jeff showing you there. So the phone shots in the beginning were rubbish. They were not brilliant, acceptable. I mean, I started off on the Nokia S95. God, that's 2008. Show me age. And then we went to an, an iPhone 4. Then I went to a 6S. I'm on a 7 Plus now. I'm debating the move to a 12 Pro Max. Um, yeah. Rob, yeah. Rob, Wilson, who, Rob Wilson, who's on here today as, a, as our marketing admin guy. He's, which one have you bought, Rob? The 12, the 12 Pro, and it is phenomenally good. Yeah, yeah, and he's going on about it. But there are other phones to look at. So there's obviously Samsung. Um, and the one thing that's come out of all of this, which was unexpected, I think, and we can take that back to when the camcorders was, we could take a frame off a piece of video, mm -hmm. and it was kind of a giveaway image. I mean, now with, say, the Panasonic, where we've got 4K and 6K, that pulling that frame off 30 frames a second, that's 30 pictures a second of continuous film, you can pull off more action shots and mm. then perfectly acceptable as well. All right. I also you're think... Ahead, Paul. You're, ruining, you're, ruining the, you're ruining the future of the, the show here. 
Right. What have you got for me now? No, I just, can we see this? Is the gray box gone? No, but don't worry about it. We've got no choice but to move on, young man. It's, it's, only, it's, it's only at the top now, Jeff. It's not, it's not interfering with the, the images. It's on my right. Very bizarre. Oh, yeah. Okay, no worries. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, Simon, can you tell us about your parakeet? Yeah. Uh, these are obviously a non-native and exotic bird. Uh, species that have been populating all over the globe. Um, and uh, this is in my garden. Uh, again, it's something about uh, sort of enjoying the things that are around you. I made some photos in uh, the beginning of the year with uh, the cherry blossom and the, the parakeets eating the cher cherry blossom. And the, the goal was to try and get them to come back from the fruits that were on the crab apples and in the pear trees and things like that. And I have them coming back now. I stick apples and things like, like that into the and again, it's just another thing for lockdown, uh, you know, appreciating the things that are in your garden and the things that are around you and sharing that with the people that, you, you know, we only get to go out for very limited time uh, periods per day at the moment. And we get, do get to see the neighbours from time to time, all from, you know, safe distance uh, apart. But it's always a, a nice talking point on the on the days when it's not wet and grey and raining. It's oh, have you seen the parrots? Yeah, oh, they're so lovely and they make lots of noise and blah blah blah. And it just um, it's bringing that um, quality of nature that a lot of people miss because you're sat in your grey house with your four walls with your central heating and stuff like that. And um, this is something that kind of links us all together it's a it's a very obvious big noisy bird and they are pretty birds they're, they're very beautiful uh whether you like them or not they they're you've got to appreciate them they're the males once they, they've got this the plum colored slaty plum color around the neck and the the blue in the tails and the red bill color is more much more vivid as is their their collar than the than the females and the youngsters. It, it's a very striking bird. And when you've got non-bird watchers uh, coming up to you going, oh, I saw some birds today. And they're really like psyched because they've seen yeah. these gigantic, really noisy birds. It's like, oh, I saw some birds today. And they're sharing, sharing that with you. You know, it's, it's a connection. And it, it's something that we can all use uh, in this, uh, in the lockdown at the moment. So mm -hmm. Is it my best photo? No, far from. Uh, but I think it's very reminiscent of the kind of sphere of, of my lockdown uh, ethos, as it were. It's like, yeah, this is something that normal normal people, not weirdos like us who are all habituated on the bird drugs, uh, it's something that you can ha lock onto and, and, and share directly with the, the people around you and stuff. Yeah, it's improved. And it, the value is then added on the nature. So the, the onus becomes then, you know, Wildlife has a has a has a has a value. Then it improves people's lives. Nice, nice. Yeah, the uh, and as rose rings, I mean rose ring parakeets in particular. As parakeets go, they're actually on the quiet side uh, yeah. for the birds compared to conures and things that you know or monks. You know, yeah, so loud. They're kind of muted at least, but yeah, still extremely loud. But as as parakeets go, it's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeff, do you know there's a place in Surrey in the UK, there's a cricket club, it's very famous when they first came in. And I don't know how big the roost is now in winter, but they were talking 6,000 plus birds. Yeah. Near your house. Yeah. Oh, oh don't get me wrong. God, I'm God, that be, that's seriously loud, man. Great to see. I mean, not as good as the Starlings mimation, but 6,000 parakeets. I mean, I, I think I heard heard on the radio, Radio 4, BBC Radio 4 the other week, that they're thinking of culling them in the UK as well. Wow. Weird. All right. But, I mean, that starts off another thing. Oh, my giddy ant. So, them. this is uh, in my garden, such as it is. In your garden? In my, in my backyard, yeah. Um, for those in the, we've got a, a pair of pileated woodpeckers that come back and forth. And this is, this is uh, the female. Um, the female has the, the black mustachial stripe here and the front half of the crown is black. The male would be solid red here with a red mustachial stripe down here. Um, but this is uh, a video actually still. With a tongue. Got tongue. Let's we'll see. This is the slow-mo. I don't know if it's going to show up well or not here, but looks like it's stuck here. I might have to play her again. 
but I just love the slow-mo video. Um, you know, the, the frame rate that we're getting here is, I think, making this difficult. But um, trust me, this is, you know, not all pixelated uh, normally. You can see the uh, tongue, we, Jeff. You can see the tongue popping out. That's yeah, that's the one nice thing about, about this high speed or slow motion video is that uh, you get to see this motion and you get to see what's happening that, you know, uh, normally you just can't. You know, no. you can see the, they close their eye just before impact. Um, the, the crest flares and swings over top of the head uh, when they strike. And then uh, you can see this head, the, the sticky tongue, you know, kind of go in and out. Uh, it's not working real well. Hopefully this isn't going to be a sign of things to come. But what you were talking about, um, Paul, uh, by shooting at these higher frame rates, uh, you can literally stop this and go back and forth, find the still that you want, make sure it's clear and just pluck it out. Um, and, and it's really sharp. And you can see in the moments in between the, uh, the pixelation, I think, um, yeah. what I'm talking about. I love that idea of slow-mo. I really do. I was we were lucky in the UK about three years ago to have a beluga whale up the River Thames near London. Get your head around that, okay? Mm -hmm. We get quite a few whales up, up, the, up the Thames and we've obviously the beachings and going on. But this beluga whale, apparently was some kind of bridge being built next to the Dartford Bridge and the scientifics, they couldn't, the scientists, they couldn't go under the water and do all the seismic, what they need to do because of this whale. It got postponed for a good few many weeks and I went down and I thought, I'll make a quick video. And I ended up making a video, but I had to just shoot it all in slow-mo because all you got was the blowhole, gone. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. had to literally, and tracking it because you never knew where it was going to come up next. Again, yeah. going back to that synonym of <laughs> where, banging, on the, banging at, the, at the fair on the hole where the little, you know, the little rabbit comes up. But yeah, the slow-mo shows so, so much more. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. I just love slow mo. I just keep shooting. I mean, I Wait, shot yeah, um, the llama guy. That llama guy shot like we did on the last one. The last one we did the zoom, and I got that llama guy shot. I couldn't really show it because I literally had a llama guy going past you in full frame with a bone in its mouth and just this big wings flapping across. And for me, the human eye takes so much more in when you use a slow mo. It just sucks mm -hmm. it in all that information as opposed to. Yeah, it's great to see something in real time. Got no problem with that. And I like that as well. But slow-mo, you can just digest it more. You can, you you can, can see what's it. really happening yeah, rather you can than just a blur of the motion. It. It's really, really good. Yeah, I missed that. Oh, dear. So this one, uh, this is, uh, again, one of Robert Wilson's shots, uh, Avocets. Uh, I'm not sure if this was also from our show in February. We did have some Avocets we were shooting uh, there in, uh, in Port Aransas in Texas. But these are... Uh, you know, in basic plumage or winter plumage uh, avocets. We'll let you look at those a little bit and we'll move on to round four. Uh, Robert Wilson again, uh, great blue herons at a rookery. Uh, they've got a ritualized uh, courtship they'll do with the adults where they'll get up on top of the, the nesting <clears throat> platform and exchange sticks and um, uh, various bits of nesting material with the wings out. It's really, uh, quite um quite a show you yeah, see the, the color in them at that time of year is amazing yeah, yeah. everything brightens up immensely um you know on parents and eagles high breeding plumage there yeah the, laws, the blue on the laws and stuff uh okay i'm up again so in, in the garden and we're talking about you know the advancements in the phones paul yeah in particular. um so this is the 11 pro max which of course until just you know, a month ago was the greatest iPhone um, option, you know, and in every successive generation, it doesn't matter which phone you're in, moving to a newer phone, if you tried it years ago and didn't have much success, I promise you, if you start again with a new phone, um, especially behind something, the, the you know, the Promenar glass um, on a, like a Koa um, 883 or a 553 or whatever else, you're going to be amazed. But you can see the size of the pupils on these fledged um, eastern screech owls. Screech owl, yeah. This was pre-dawn. Um, there was a family group that had come through. They didn't nest there. I hadn't seen them. The two adults, and they had four youngsters in tow. And I went running out there and tried to get them in the scope and, and shot these images. And 
um, I was shooting using that, well, the, the phone defaulted to the night mode, which basically shoots a bunch of bunches of pictures and stitches them together. And it makes complete dark, you know, almost look like daytime. Um, this was <laughs> with no light and it was not, these things were just shadowy figures, you know, but um, it just to go show you what the technology can do um, on these, these young screech owls before the sun had come up. Um, and they were literally just shadowy blobs to the naked eye, but uh, this is through the COA scope with uh, that night mode. Um, and another thing that made this real special was um, I'd done some bird banding years ago, ringing as you gentlemen call it on the other side of yeah. the pond. And um, I had a, a, a male screech owl that had nested in the yard for many years that I had banded or ringed, I guess about seven years before. And I happened to notice this real grizzled looking adult um, bird that was, you know, chasing these youngsters around feeding them. And I happened to notice that glint of a little leg band on the, on the one side and, and realized that this was uh, that same bird, probably nine, 10 years old with a, you know, four youngsters in tow. I was like, you go old, man. I'm proud of you. You know, that's old as screech owls go, but that, that find your own recovery. Yeah, yeah. Well, this that made, that made this a real special moment that he kind yeah. of brought the kids back to see. This is where I used to hang out in the old hood, you know. Um, so yeah, so that's it for me, Paul Hackett. What are we doing? Whoa, what we got? Okay, in July last year, I think we were allowed out. Yes, we were, ish. And um, I've been traveling around in Arkansas and. A couple of friends had mentioned to me a family of kestrels had um, just literally um, been, you know, been released out of the nest. And I went down to the place where it was, and it was a paddock at the back of um, a water treatment place. So plenty of insects, plenty of mammals. There were, there were, there was four of them, four young birds. This is a young kestrel, obviously. And I just sat on the gate for about an hour. And then I got to this guy to come running past me. Thought, oh, have you seen the kestrels? Yeah, yeah, they're over there, mate. So this guy then proceeds to run round and he's chasing these kestrels. And basically, he was literally not far off running up to him. So what does a bird do when it's confronted with a threat? It flies off. Anyway, the guy stuck it out for about 40 minutes. I doubt if he got anything. And he left. He came past me. I didn't say anything to him. Away he went. So by that time, I'd been watching the behavior. So I then walked around. It took me about 10 minutes to walk around to where it was. And I plonked myself down. And I noticed that the birds um, was literally coming to these posts. So um, I just sat down and hunkered down. And blow me, this bird came down to within about 15 yards. And I'd kind of move left and right I'd got myself pinned down to about two posts that I wanted to do it. So I'm probably there, probably there about 50 minutes, an hour. And it came in about four times to these two posts. So this picture for me is about portrait. So I spent quite a bit of time setting it up. And as with our depth of field, we, we've got that situation where we've got a shallow depth of field. So everything behind is blurred. And I just love that green hue at the top. So I'd kind of taken a record shot tried to work out what mag I was on. I think I was on about 30 mag, 20, 25 to 30 mag, 30 mag, probably 30 mag. Yeah. It was not on the 25 and this bird. And I'd love getting shots where the bird's not looking at you. So it's disinterested in you. So, so to me, I'd sat quiet enough and I'd got the shot and you walk away or the bird flies off and then you walk away. And it's a lovely feeling that the bird went of its own thing. I think the parents were calling it because they got some food. Off they went to mum or dad to get fed. And I just love those kind of shots. I think I shot something like in those in that hour, I shot something like 400 pictures and I kept about 27, 28 pictures. But it's so easy to do, you know. And I've got mates, Jeff, who would go, oh, that piece of grass at the bottom. And they'll spend three and a half hours in Photoshop removing that. Yeah. Me. There was no way I could get rid of that by going left or right. Sometimes you can get a good background by just moving the tripod a foot left or a foot right. Not mm -hmm. for me. That, yeah. I was happy. So that yeah. to me yeah. was probably one of my best all-time classic portrait shots of me. And I like the colour scheme. 
of the field that was in the, it had been cut the grass had been cut so that's then been collected in so that's the stubble and then the, the the fence line at the back you can't see the fence line but you can see the trees overhanging again just setting your composition up it's mm -hmm. not difficult just using your eyes that's what it's basically about yeah you guys it's funny you know listening to you guys talk to compared to me uh you know you brought up the point earlier paul that i'm the birder of the that's probably why i'm still Very good birder jeff excellent i'm still birder. using the phone and you know, I just shoot from the hip and I do not think about, you know, trying to set up or wait for an image or any of that. I just kind of get them as they come to me. You know, it's good equipment, a lot of opportunity, but I'm on the move most of the time and just shoot from the hip as I'm going along. But you make the good point about, you know, again, it accentuates, you can keep at, at a greater distance um, and get these more natural shots, you know, uh, digiscoping than you can say with a, you know, 400 mil or 500 mil lens when you're shooting at 1500 or to 3000 millimeter uh, as an example. So just another, let's see here. Yeah, I like that one. And boom. There we go. Let's see how this works, Simon. Yeah. Whoops, hold on. I'm afraid we might not, if you want to try and share yourself, if it's just too goofy, we'll let it cycle through. Yeah, can I, I'll see if I can just pull it up on my computer, if that's easier to do it that way. Yeah, I'll uh, stop the share and you'll see if it, you can, if it's any better. Um, tell me when you're ready, I'll stop share. There we go. Yeah, just swap it over and I'll, I'll yep. smash it up. Yeah, sorry, the video uh, is leaving a lot to be desired. That's really um, some good videos. Um, you know, I kind of, when I saw the the woodpecker, I was like, because oh, that's super crisp throughout, so I knew we were having some difficulties. We'll see if it works better if you share them directly. At any rate, um, you know, we're having a lot of fun um, talking about this stuff and um, it's just, uh, it's great fun shooting what you're at, enjoying what comes to you um, and the stuff that, uh, that you may see. Looks like you're sharing. Yeah. We can see it, Simon. That's is it better. streaming? Yeah, it's streaming, mate. Is it fluid? No, it's still no. <laughs> it's still kind of uh, jumping around. Sorry to say. Yeah. Okay. Not really sure uh, what to do with that. And we had this problem last time, didn't we? With uh, with this stuff, we can pop the we can pop the video up somewhere later. Yeah. So in the vein of um, appreciate what's around you. Uh, and this is a starling's roost, and this is actually um, a roost that's gone on for um, a couple of years. This this is kind of cheating a little bit. This is footage uh, not from 2020, but from the uh, the end of 2019. I went back a few few times and uh, shot stuff, but this was one of my favourite pieces, really, that showed what it was. And um, obviously, these are all migratory birds that are coming in. <clears throat> And the swarms they make are enormous. And you always talk about uh, stalling uh, murmurations, but this whole group were not murmurating. They just come in and they land uh, straight away. And I think that's got to do with the fact that um, lots of um, uh, long-eared owls, mm. lots of long-eared owls are hitting them and goshawks are hitting them. And I think uh, if they don't go down quickly enough, they don't get any... Um, protection from it but uh there's like 20 or thirty thousand birds here maybe even more than that uh, at the highest points but this is a reed bed that they're sitting in and obviously the reed bed is you can just kind of see in the background you can't really see it so clearly uh because if it's not streaming properly but all the reeds are just being pushed down and pushed down and pushed down so originally all the reeds are all standing up straight and then the birds just come in and just push everything down and this whole area just goes flat and the noise it's making and stuff and this is on your doorstep you know and, and some of these birds have flown all the way from you know the the, the russian birds 
So uh, they're, they're, they're truly international, these little guys, and they come and um, spend the winter with us and pick at bits and pieces. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to um, be sharing um, <laughs> that kind of uh, environment with, with them. Um, wax them with a bit of This is them all uh, coming in. And uh, this is completely unedited, so you can kind of see it's like, oh, there's a thing. And then you swing the scope around and there's more. And I don't know which high angle they're coming in from. And you're like a kid in a, in a sweet shop just uh, trying to follow them all. I love that effect where you've got them uh, in the front foreground and they're flying slower than what they are in the background. And you get this whole kind of 3D blur because it is, it's this giant moving mass um, super organism of, of creatures that are, you know, trying to avoid eating and uh, trying to keep themselves uh, with their own heads above water and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really cool. Um, uh, we can pop the video up somewhere on the on the Facebook. I'll shoot the file over or something. And you can put it on the Cowers yeah. site, and then uh, people can uh, have a look at it and stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, in theory, uh, um, uh, a bird that you see all over the place. It's not a bird that's difficult to see in the summer, but these are not the birds that are here in the in the in the summer. These are all birds from, you know, Scandinavia and much 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 further afield. Mm -hmm. And uh, to see them in such big numbers, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, that whole thing about. Um, uh, we all have nationalities and things like that, but uh, these 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 guys just existing and they're doing what they can to kind of get through and stuff and yeah i don't know if i'm articulating this correctly but no it's, boundaries it's, uh, it's, no boundaries yeah there's just no boundaries they don't don't respect Brilliant. those Absolutely their language Brilliant. or whatever it's like you know um, and to just sit there and just watch these tiny little creatures that are covering giant distances and to sort of um it's the beauty of the the, the super telephoto uh, magnification that you get from from scopes to be right in there amongst all these birds, and you can see their heads. They're shouting at each other and having a little peck and a fight over who gets to sit at the top of the the reed stem and who sits at the bottom of the reed stem because there is literally a pecking order. Pecking order. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you know it's it's a buzz. I think it's why we everybody has their own little thing about what attracts them to birds and birding and stuff like that, but. To be, uh, you know, transplanted to to where to in amongst that um, in amongst that colony, it's it's for me, it's a re it's a real kick. It's a you know uh, to get get really really close into the into amongst the birds where uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's 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 kind of a cool. It's a not very common all all round bird and stuff, but it's just so cool to be uh, in amongst a super group like that. You know, a super organism. I think too um you know with especially with covid it was um refreshing to see that you know uh these birds are um not affected by covid and you know their migration goes on and in that that was reassuring for me to see um you know the migrants come through as always you know to even though our life had changed so much this is a constant reminder okay things are gonna be all right you know it's yeah it's still... yeah there was there was talk in the uk i think i do listen to Ra bbc radio 4 a lot jeff over here because the bbc Ra bbc radio just speak the truth don't you know god bless them and there was talk of um um areas where the nesting areas of birds on reserves and stuff have got a better yield of youngsters off because of less disturbance mm -hmm. whatever that may mean yeah. But there was quite a bit of a talk of it in November about it as well, December. It had been yeah, a good year for birds because similar, people have, yeah. Similar information over here, especially, you know, beach yeah. nesting birds and things where yeah. people weren't able to, you know, get out there and be harassing them. They had one less pressure or stressor. Uh, Robert Wilson, one of his favorite shots, you know, is this spoonbill. It's just stunning. Uh, again, in, in high breeding plumage. Can you see it? Yeah, it's a cracking yeah. shot. Okay. Cracking shot. Yeah, adult in, in high breeding plumage, again, that skin colors turn that yellow mixing with the lime green and the bill is just getting all speckled and, um, you know, they're at their brightest color. They're spectacular birds, the roseate spoonbill. Um, this is my favorite shot of the year by far. Uh, oh, God, yeah, I remember you posting this. This is uh, with the 553, the little 55 millimeter compact. Small it, scope. Uh, yeah, little weighs under a pound. It's barely longer than my hand. And um, I had that out. This is, uh, you know, midsummer, 
Uh, we're kind of the doldrums of summer. Migration is not going on. So I was spending more time looking at the insects. And this is um, a little green orchid bee, we call these critters. And they come in and they'll, you know, feed in these, uh, these small flowers. This is a Himalaya patens or a, a butterfly bush, as we call them. Um, and this is the one time, probably, Paul, that I can say all year that I actually sat and tried to wait for the shot. <laughs> um, and I spent about 45 minutes trying to catch one of these little <laughs> bugs. And when you're at that close distance at, you know, minimal focus and, um, you know, what was, the minimum, what was the minimum focus distance you were at from the insect? Uh, he, mm, I don't even remember. You know, I was, I was at like, I was maybe 15 <laughs> foot away from this bush, maybe. Oh my God. Uh, but, you know, but just trying to get one of these things. And like you said, with the, the weasel story, similar story. Every time I get one flower in view and, and again, my depth of focus is so shallow. We're talking just, know. you know, inches at this point. I finally caught one. Um, with the light at my back, I was on the right flower that it went to next, you know, I just, and, and managed to just burst off a, a series of frames. And I was just amazed when I, I looked at this thing. Um, here's a little, and that's from, that's from a phone. That's an iPhone. Everybody. That's from an iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. Look yeah. at You've even captured the proboscis. Look at that. Yeah. Length yeah. Of that. It's as long as the body. It's, yeah. it's not far off. Yeah. Wow. That's a yeah. great shot, Jeff. That was my favorite. So it was something different. Um, not the same old, same old for me. And to capture this thing, just freeze it midair, oh. you know, was my, my favorite moment. I can believe oh. it. That's a, yeah, it's a cracking shot. Oh, here we go. Is this my last one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I made this my number one because I made three visits to this place. Um, it's a derelict building. I won't really say where it is. It's a derelict building and I was on the road and I was, and it's all fenced off and these birds are above and they'd made a nest. And I'd, uh, I'd noticed we'd, we'd got information. Everybody knew, everybody, some people knew about where the birds were, but we, I never published this bird. I kept it quiet. And it was basically trying to get a flight shot of probably the fastest bird in the world. Yeah. Um, so for me to actually get something, the light was with me, Jeff, so I could bang the ISO up on the camera to get a fast shutter speed and obviously in multiverse mode and I shoot in raw and have done for a while now. Uh, but to get a picture and look again, the bird isn't looking at me. It's looking and basically some crows had come across and this, this, this female just launched herself off and just chased these, these crows. And then this was after the after the the swoop, and then come back down again. So maybe slow down a bit for me to capture it. But it just shows you that anything is possible. And somebody will say, "Well, you went three times." Yes, I did. And how many pictures did you shoot? Lots. Uh, how many did I keep? I probably kept over those three visits no more than nine or ten. And they were into the hundreds. There was lots of blurred pictures because obviously it's the basic thing. If people, again, I understand the digiscoping, I've got, the, I've got my hand on my camera. I've got my hand on my scope on the focus wheel. Okay. And I'm moving that focus wheel as I look through the viewfinder. I've got to keep up with the bird that's physically moving. It's probably one of the most difficult things we have to do in digiscoping. Um, but to get this image, and it's a half decent image. I'm quite pleased with it. And because I gave you the backstory where it literally just zoomed off, you actually, as I said, it just literally zoomed down on these crows and just, they just scattered. I think it was three or four birds and they just literally scattered out the way. And then this bird was literally back up and they just come up and just literally on the crest. So I was lucky to get it as it literally had done that. I tracked it, I tried to track it and I just caught it as it came back up on the loop and caught it on the top. So yet again, a bit of a fluke, but for people not understanding this about this, that's manual focus, tracking a bird through a very small field of view because we've got such high mag. And that's probably why that's my number one pick because of the concentration needed to keep that up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and for the first, the, first, the first five or 10 minutes, they're all blurred because you've, you've got to get your eye in. You've got to get your eye in. So I, I kind of, 
slacken off on the video on the video head i get the clutch right so literally the camera i let go of it and it just stays in position it's not drooping forward it's not so i just get that and get the balance plate right so the whole balance of the scope and the camera at the back is balanced that's why i've got quite a really long plate i have it's about at least a foot long but all that is all key to being relaxed get setting get stuck in and also with my tripod i can extend it up to my up to my eye line because I have a straight scope, so I'm not bending my back as opposed to you would be with a, a an angled scope. So it suits my purpose that I bought the I bought the scope. I had the scope in the first instance that I could do flight shots, and uh, the Gitsu one I have, it's got three tri three le three leg sections, and it goes really really high. So I can probably get it to about this height. So I can angle it down, and I'm still not bending. So when I used to go to Spain, that seems a distant memory now where I was doing the eagles and the vultures over there. It was just easy to track them. But um, I can't wait to go back there. This, um, I've got a chance to go back to the Lamagaya place and the Golden Eagle place again. I want to go back there and do that and do more vid. But hey, so that's the, that's the, that's the number one, Jeff, and the reason why. And I hope Perfect. people understand why. The I fastest know. bird in the world. Yeah, 200 miles an hour in, in a dive. Yeah. yeah. So Simon, you, let's try this. You want to try it here, or just go straight to your computer? Uh, I can screen share again, but uh, well, I, I can't remember what we did last time. Now to get it, we did something last time, didn't we? To when I was showing I, I some did it again, but uh, you know, I think more and more people are using Zoom too. So it's just it could be. Um, uh, yeah, I'll share. I'll do a screen share, and we can just uh, again. again uh, oh, can it? I can't start sharing because Hold you're on, sharing. Stop share first. Tell me when you got it up. You ready? Yeah. All right. And then Simon's uh, final. Yeah, now Simon. Oh, you had it up uh, on the screen then. It's not easy to see, Mark, is it? Wow. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll all be jerky. But um, yeah, so for oh, the last. Look at um, them number of years i've been doing a lot of volunteer volunteering to um count and uh find pine martens in the uh, north north holland uh, dunes um, we use a lot of um uh, camera traps and things like that to uh, identify the individuals and um uh, track them all down and uh, this is a one of the families uh, that was found uh, huge thank you to everybody else that's in the group because I wouldn't have seen these if I wouldn't if I hadn't have got the help that uh, I did uh, because they're so mobile. That's mother that's sticking her head out now and she has a red squirrel foot in her mouth. So <laughs> that's what they've had for dinner is red squirrel and she just uh, drops that little foot on the on the top of the uh, on that nook of the tree. But that this is really dead typical behavior for them they have a, a, a favored nest hole where they are that was the uh, it's one of the young you can see the young just has a little pink uh, pink nose and it's a little bit more fluffy downy than the than the parents um and they're really fat and they look really unstable in the tree and sometimes they do fall out of the trees um what you have is that the the knock of the tree and that's the latrine uh, that's their toilet. So in the in the height of the season, that's one of the best ways you can find them, is for looking for holes, uh, trees that have got lots of flies buzzing around them, because obviously uh, the families uh, are eating a lot and they you know excrete and uh, and whatever and, and leave uh, little piles of poop and uh, urine in in the in the in the trees where they're, they're sitting in. So that's a good tip for anybody who's out and about and has any big big trees uh, is look for flies and, and the holes it's another one of the, the parent uh, one of the youngsters bear in mind that uh, he's lo looking dead at me but i am about a hundred and that was mother actually that was just going out i'm, I'm about 120 foot away this is on about 50 times magnification um and looking up uh i guess this is about 15 meters high 10 to 15 meters high and this is uh, about 5 a.m in the morning just uh, just after first light so it's not really good light yet and you're under the canopy of the trees uh, so yeah you know there's there's some noise and whatever that you get into the thing but uh, they're just absolutely adorable and, and to, to get to see them is, is a real treat 
they've actually this is a, a success story if you will is that uh, they've been taken off the um the red list for uh, dutch for, in the netherlands so they're not listed as a red listed uh, animal anymore which is really nice pie martens where st uh, beach martens or stone martens are also not are off that list as well uh, but we have, uh, yeah, so good as 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 good as no st pine uh, stone martens in in this area. They, they are there, but they're in such small numbers that they you you just don't reliably get to see them. But the pine martens are uh, in some places on the up. Uh, they're incredibly uh, shy, and you tend not to see them at all. So to get to see them at a nest and um, uh, to have them just climbing around in the tree like this is a testament to good fieldmanship. It's, it's you know, I'm 150 foot away, hidden. Uh, the, I'm, you can see them occasionally looking at me, so I'm pretty sure that they know that there's something there, but they're not bothered by it. It's like I'm, I'm far enough away to, to let mum uh, go climb in and out of the tree with food, bringing food back and forth to the young and the young to be just doing their own little thing and, and playing about in the in the tree as best as they can. So, uh, and that's the beauty of using the uh, telescope for making these kind of observations. It's uh, you've, you've got in incredibly good light gathering capabilities from the huge objectives, magnification if you need it. And, um, you know, because te telescopes are designed to look at things from far away. So my last video was what it's like to see lots of things together. And this is what it's like to see something special really up close. Uh, so it's, it's just uh, trying to think about how to use the tool for, to, for the various jobs that you, uh, that you, that you have. So, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, a much underused tool for videography. Um, yeah, you, um, yeah when you can get results that are pretty reasonable like this, I think anybody who uh, isn't professional would be absolutely blown away and very, very contented with this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, even if you are a professional to just be there and experience animals like this, a nest of three, it's not something that you see every day. Uh, I, I see nests almost every year and usually they're ones and quite often twos but to see a whole nest of three with mum coming, bringing food backwards and forwards, it's uh, it's pretty special. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a privilege. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. So, what does uh, co what did COVID do for me? Yeah, it made me really think about the things that were directly in my own, uh, surrounding and how I could uh, give back to it. So the volunteer work and uh, sharing uh, my observations with people that are around me so that they know these things are here so that they can appreciate them as well. Uh, so uh, it feels like we've all been really distanced with COVID, but uh, nature is the element. Being out in wildlife, enjoying wildlife is something that can bring us a lot closer together and uh, bring that kind of common ground and understanding and thing that we all all need um yeah to keep us all sane instead of just being locked up in boxes all day so absolutely so that, brilliant. that for me is probably one of the was probably one of the highlights of last year so yeah the best i really enjoyed that it's cracking mate cracking yeah thanks Good stuff yeah i'd love to see that um apologies again about the uh the gray boxes um it's the first for us zoom did another um upgrade yesterday which may have affected some of the uh, performance might be a, a glitch that hasn't worked its way out so apologies for, um, and thank you all for um, sticking with us through that um, good yeah but um, that was super I, I think good. we've been hitting a lot of the questions along the way I'm just trying to look at some of the Q&A apologize we went so long with the uh, this, um, just, just one question, Jeff. The um, yes. it's come up two or three times. The the iPhone 12 Pro, um, the the phone scope adapters. Do you, have you got a, uh, an official uh, release date on those? The US. We're expecting them uh, this month at some point, probably later towards the end. Unfortunately, um, you know they they were lagging behind with phone scope. I know they had uh, uh, some production issues um that they were still sorting out but uh the last time i spoke to them um they were expecting to be close to those so we'll say by the end of february uh, and with apologies um you know one of the downsides of getting the newest phone the latest greatest phone sometimes is um building the case for it, the proper case and everything takes a little bit longer if you get it right out of the box 
So it's coming soon. Right. But that's all I have. Yeah, the the the, just, the the questions have been really really good quality tonight. I just want to thank everybody for the engagement. It's been an absolutely fantastic webinar from, from you guys and and everybody watching as well. Yeah, just say say thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's um, it's been enjoyable again, hasn't it, gentlemen? Quite enjoyed it again. Yeah, um, it's, kinda, it's, yeah. it's inspired me to go out and uh, get out there this year now. Yeah, it totally really has. Uh, I've got have I got one species, so you know. Get I'm, I'm totally up for trying to uh, for trying. I don't think I'm going to get 150 species in uh, <laughs> in a couple of months, but I'm totally up for coming back and um, and showing you what I've got. If you, if you want to do that in a couple of months or something, I'll go out and hammer some stuff before it disappears off for the for the summer. We've got I've got lots of geese. I reckon yeah, I can get you on, on geese Holland. definitely. I have Nail no geese. geese. I have zero geese. Uh, we have many no. geese. Man, We've even got rare geese in London. In London, for God's sake, man! In Any London, goose that shows up in Florida is, is, you know, usually except for the uh, Egyptian goose, which is introduced, is kind of. Yeah. You know. Can I? Uh, is it possible just to do a quick uh, plug and a shameless sure. plug for myself? Yeah. Yeah. At beans or gold, one word, or Simon Brumby on uh, Instagram uh, for more uh, of the kind of stuff that we've been showing here today, and also uh, go digi scoping. Go digiscoping one word on uh, on Facebook. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you and uh, and see what you're all about and stuff. And any information you can reach us, reach me there anyway. Uh, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, and Paul, um, um, Paul hates Digiman on Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, we're all there. Digiscoping. Paul H. Yeah, I think it's Paul H. Paul H. Paul H. Digicam. Yeah. Yeah. Digicam and Digiman. Yeah, they're both there. I think. <laughs> and what we'll do too is, um, you know, maybe we can, uh, in the follow up here, um, <clears throat> when all is said and done, we can um, put the, the links um, on the video on YouTube as well. Uh, at any rate, I think we've got most of our questions done. I went a little bit long. We appreciate you all sticking with us. Um, we will be back with more informative and, and less sort of loosey goosey. But we wanted to start it off this way and just sort of review the year um, as such as it was and, and just show people that despite the, the worst challenges that, that we could probably face, we're all out there because we love it. And it's, uh, you know, maybe even more important than ever um, to have that connection with nature to, to help us keep our sanity. So um, with no further ado, gentlemen, it was great talking to you uh, yeah. I know it's late there. So uh, raise a pint for me. I'm a bit behind you. Uh, maybe later tonight. I'll yeah, okay. Definitely. Well, it was a good boy. I didn't, I didn't bring a bottle of beer in. I was really good. Uh, <laughs> I was just a giddy right. kipper on my own, Jeff, without any kind of help. There you go. All right. And thanks again, everyone that, that stuck with us. And I apologize for the uh, technical glitches, as such as it were. We'll get those figured out before the next one. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers, Cheers now. Take care. Bye-bye.